Okay, I understand. And is it true that SCA, uh, uh, Caleb, has more uh, people in it, members in it, compared to HEMA and other organizations? Is it true that they have more? I would say in the United States, that's probably yeah. true. Um, in the, I know that right now the SCA has the United States, it has uh, Canada and um, Australia, and then, uh, and then uh, Western Europe. But I would say that depending on the region that you're in, you probably, for instance, if you were to go to uh, Eastern or Central Europe, you'll probably find a lot more people doing the reenacting and the uh, and the HEMA uh, over there than you would in the SCA. But uh, I would say as far as rapier, people that do rapier, you probably find more people doing rapier in the SCA in the United States than you do uh, than you do people doing rapier in HEMA. But um, there are a lot of people who cross over now, people who there really isn't that much of a difference as far as the skill goes. Um, and also what the SCA calls cut and thrust combat, that's that's uh, that is almost one for one match with what uh, with HEMA longsword and side sword and messer and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I would say it used to be um, probably a larger disparity where there were a lot more people in the SCA. I would say with the in the current age, you know, of coming of in the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, I would say that HEMA is probably catching up. And um, so, but yeah, that's. Uh, and do they use always in SCA? Did I understand it correctly? They always fight uh, with the uh, rats and weapons. They don't use steel weapons. Did I understand it correctly? So that's in in uh, SCA armored combat. That was armored. the main and is the main uh, the main way of uh, of fighting in armored. There is a new discipline called steel combat, which is very similar to my understanding to um, uh, like you said, Battle of the Nations ACL, except it's to counted blows instead of uh, knocking your opponent down. So basically, it's it's using using the same kind of weapons. So using those a uh, kind of larger uh um rebated edge uh like um swords from like fabria morum and all all sorts of those different manufacturers and then going to counted blows in in uh in steel armor but and that is that is a discipline that's much more uh restrictive about what kind of protection you can wear but it's relatively minor right now it's it has only a it has only a few people doing it uh, compared to the other discipline of armored combat in the SCA, which does use rattan. And then when you're using pole arms um, and maces, you use a uh, padded um, padded foam to um, to simulate the heads of those weapons and to simulate the uh, the thrusting tip of them. Yes, absolutely. Um, is a SCA run as a centralized organization, or is it like they have different organizations and each one has its own headquarters? Yeah, so you've got the uh, the board of directors, uh, which is called the BOD by a lot of people. So they they uh, create the the larger corporate policy. So it is a it's a non for profit It's a federally recognized non for profit organization that's run by a board of directors. And uh, so in that sense, yes, it is centralized. Then you've got the different regions, which are called kingdoms. And um, those usually involve, I would say, three to five or maybe even more states in the United States or in Western Europe. The Western Europe is, is one kingdom. Uh, but anyway, so those have their own, their own, uh, they have a king and queen. And those, and they also have people that run them uh, that are other officers. So the seneschal is what one would probably call kind of the uh, uh, the executive uh, vice president uh, for for a company, and you know people who run the the legal side of the house, all sorts of different offices. So, um, but I would say they have they create policies that affect um, affect more minor aspects of the uh, of kind of the day to day in those uh, in those different regions or kingdoms but the board of directors are the ones who create the larger and probably more important and liability uh, associated policies like you know div diversity equity and, and inclusion and uh, i think they've they've be, they've had a larger role in the uh, in covid-19 policies 
and things like that. So uh, it's it's centralized for the board of directors, but uh, but I would say somewhat decentralized as far as allowing the things, the uh, more regular day to day uh, to go out to the regions and then the sub regions. Okay, very nice, very good. And um, let us just now uh, go back and talk about other type of martial arts training and combatives and things you learned in the military before we go, what you did in the military, if you wish. Let us talk about combatives yeah. or any other martial arts you trained there. I would like to hear that, please. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I started out in the military with uh, learning um, what the Army calls uh, uh, combatives or Army combatives. I think they call it MACP, which is Mar Modern Army Combatives Program, uh, which is really based on, um, on uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So that's very uh, learning, learning basic learning basic takedowns you you learn how to shrimp you know one of the first things you do is you learn how to shrimp on the mat and you learn uh you learn how to do different chokes and you're you're doing it in your military fatigues as well so you do different chokes you learn to uh fight from the guard you learn to pass the guard you learn to get them out you learn how to uh uh you know do an arm bar learn how to uh do a triangle choke you know all sorts of those those basic things and then you progress further up so i did uh i'm i've uh i've done combatives up to level two i think it goes up to level five which uh, in which case they go, they have actual competitions that look a lot like a regular mixed martial arts competition. Uh, so that's that's the unarmed combative side of the house in the army. And like I said, it's really very similar to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. If you're if you know anything about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you you'll do just fine in army combatives. So, but that's also been pretty much suspended uh, for most intents and purposes since the pandemic because of because of the proximity for people and, and uh, the army, I, man, I would be surprised if almost any posts are running a full combatives program right now because of the, uh, because of the pandemic. Just so, may I just uh, come but, in, I know in, for example, where I yeah. live now in Frankfurt, many grappling schools closed. They couldn't take the financial burden anymore. Right. Although the government yeah. helped many wrestling clubs, many grappling and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So on the civilian side, because, of course, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. it is not like karate. You can do Qatar. You can do your strikes or rock boxing. You need the proximity of another human being. So, of course. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I love. I'm not a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner myself. I'd love to get into it someday. I love watching it. I'm a UFC fan. I'm a mixed martial arts fan, and I love watching um, watching Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructors talk about their art. Uh, like Faraz is a hobby in uh, uh, talking with, uh, with Joe Rogan and and talking. And there's so many there's so many things that you can learn about the culture of martial arts just by watching other people and listening to other people talk about it that can provide more insight into how you do it. So it's really cool to see Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and especially uh, see how it how it affected mixed martial arts and um, and that evolution of how it changes over time because it's so fresh and it's still and it's still changing so much and mixed martial arts changes relate relating to it as well you know seeing recently how heel hooks you know how heel hooks have become you know from something obscure to something much more much more uh that everyone has to know uh, you know if you're if you're a competitive mixed martial artist you have to you have to know how to do a heel hook and you have to know how to defend against one if you want to be competitive to any level and that wasn't true probably even five years ago but now it certainly is so uh Anyway, that's on the unarmed side of the house, but I've also done uh, a lot of the tactical uh, martial arts, or I would, I would call it martial arts, with uh, firearms. So um, while I was in the military, I pursued a lot of my own training with, uh, with um, different tactical training companies in the United States, learning and police agencies and tactical agencies, um, learning, learning firearms and learning how to, uh, how to use them effectively. So... I went through uh, SWAT training with the Texas Tactical Police Officers Association, then doing um, 
I uh, worked with a company called Redback One, where I did uh, CQB uh, training at the old, what used to be Blackwater's facility. Now I believe it's called Academy. Uh, and then, and then uh, also doing a low light training uh, with a company called Stratagos International. So that was a lot of fun to learn, to learn how firearms and learn how uh, really what modern uh modern battlefield combat looks like at least with small arms and uh and individuals so that's that's a lot of my training uh with with that in the military and on a competitive side i, I forgot to I, I didn't want to just interrupt you in the beginning you were competing yeah. in three disciplines of firearms and when you went to california then they were not legal may i know which uh, i mean what is not illegal in california is another question but uh, yeah, <laughs> what were you yeah, competing so, there right <laughs> so i was living in central texas when i was doing uh, when i was doing uh firearms competition so uh with the idpa uh and uh with three gun and with other kind of minor uh organizations so uh, a lot of those are based on using um magazines that have a a high capacity semi-automatic firearms and um with all sorts of you know different attachments like different kinds of grips different kind of ops optical sites so uh i was going to um in Texas, most things are uh, are legal, at least within the common practice, within the common lexicon. I think uh, there are restrictions against using a fully automatic weapon in those competitions, but then there are some some competitions that allow that too. But that requires federal licensure. So uh, in California, they have to. There's a lot of restrictions on um, on semi-automatic weapons with uh, with um, detachable magazines. So, uh, having, I think, uh, magazine capacities over like 10 rounds, having, uh, weapons that were, that are on the national firearms, um, the NFA, uh, registry, which allows for short belt rifles, suppressed rifles, things like that. And, um, and, uh, so I think maybe I probably, I probably had maybe one or two, firearms that were that were legal in california uh and most of my other stuff were not because most of my stuff was based around uh um semi-automatic firearm competitions with typically high magazine capacities over 10 rounds so that was that really became something where i would have to endure incur quite a bit of personal expense in order to modify those firearms in order to be in order to be a uh, um able to do that there they there are people that do do uh firearms competitions in california i shouldn't i shouldn't dismiss that whole community but they use a very different equipment than um than for instance people in texas very nice uh, and i mean uh, yeah of course as you mentioned this is also a part of uh, martial arts as you mentioned that firearms training is mm -hmm. very important i mean it is part of martial arts is you know, we need to face the reality which we are having, you know. And uh, another yeah. thing I would like to uh, ask. If I can add. It, sure, sure. If I can add one thing to that, I think one thing that really um, gave me a great deal of insight into um, swordsmanship while doing firearms was also seeing people who uh, did that for a living, who competed in that for a living and ach achieved incredibly high levels of skill because most people in the sword community, they do it as a hobby. And, and um, it's not something where, you know, they're usually uh, not professional athletes and they're usually people who, uh, who have to balance that with their, you know, have a work-life balance and then have a, and then you know this is a hobby on top of their family and on top of what they do for a living so uh whereas in the firearms community there are a number of people who do that professionally and are able to do it professionally so you get people who just achieve incredibly you know superhuman levels of skill there's a uh, there's a guy named um jerry michelik who's this incredible uh firearms competitor and uh both his wife and his daughter are also uh are also top level athletes in uh, in three gun and practical pistol, and I had the opportunity to compete with uh, on a team with him at one event, and the guy was just it, he was just incredible, and and it was it got it gave me the opportunity to see how good someone can get at something if you really just train at it constantly like it's your job, 
And, uh, you know, for an average person who has a gun, you know, maybe visits the range maybe a few times a year compared to someone who is training constantly and is a competitive IDPA or, uh, or three gun competitor, there's, there's, there's no comparison. And for, and in a lot of ways, I think I take that to my swordsmanship where you have to be disciplined and aggressive and constantly train at it in order to get good at it. You can't just, you can't just sit there and, and play with it and expect to get good. I mean, thank you very much. I mean, you come from uh, from a military like Myers, like Hayden, like many of uh, American military guys, but also police captains, which I interviewed, who I'm, whom I interviewed for this channel. And also, as you know, from mm -hmm. Kukushin Circle, Full Contact Creator, MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and so. And one thing which I, and I said again openly, I have been saying it for a swordsmanship community. When I came here and I, being an athlete myself, coming there here, and I, I was really surprised that people, as you said, not that I want to criticize, because they didn't have enough time to understand that any physical activity, right, you need a body for that, right? You need to train for that, as you mentioned that, right? Because otherwise, yes. how can you, because, you know, because martial arts, as I said, as, and as we all know, is no different, as I said. There is no secret or all these things that many people say. You need a body for that. You know, for example, I, I do, as you might know, Caleb, I do long-distance swimming. So I had professional mm -hmm. swimmers who taught me to swim in the ocean, like for kilometers. And you don't see any professional swimmer with a... Um, who's not fit you know what i mean they're all yeah. fit right and you know and when i came here to this community say guys you need to do sports that's the most important <laughs> thing forget all these you know nice techniques not that i'm saying techniques are not important but the first technique is physical fitness which we know it from military we should know it from police force as you said professional athletes everyone knows that you know <laughs> i mean it's not only the yeah. technique and i really I have, i'm happy that you say the same thing because this is extremely important physical fitness for any physical activity we do and martial arts are like basketball like football like anything you have a physical activity and accordingly you need to train for that so it's extremely important which is as you know unfortunately sometimes ignored you know what i mean right yeah yeah you know i think that there's that's that's a huge you know that's a huge topic in and of itself i think uh there's certainly i think people neglect the athleticism of of uh practicing martial arts in the in the modern context at least practicing historical martial arts uh but at the same time i think you can also get a little bit too far into that by mythologizing people in the past as like supermen. Sometimes people see, think like, oh, these people were, because they were uh, laborers, then maybe they, they were incapable of understanding that stuff. And I think that's, that's maybe a little bit too far into it. Uh, you know, one thing that that's a context about a lot of these historical manuals is that um, these most historical manuals were made for the literate you know, they're just by the very nature of it, they're a manual is made for someone who can read it. And people who were literate uh, back in the past were not necessarily people who were who were laboring all day, every day. Uh, they were training and they were and they were they were athletes in and of themselves. They were athletes probably by our perspective, by our modern um, by our modern categorization. Uh, but they weren't they weren't they didn't have unattainable body types. You know, someone who was a who is a uh, a noble uh, a noble of that time who would read who would be able to read uh, you know Lichtenauer's uh, you know the the manuals of Lichtenauer tradition or uh, or Murazzo or or uh, or in the in the Persian in the Persian context you know someone who who would be able to who would be able to to read and uh, you know they would be they would they were how to put this they were athletes but they weren't they didn't have unattainable body types and I think that there were that um, we can't sometimes i see people going a little too far into that into that realm where they say oh you know people in the past they were so different than us you know we're we're incapable of understanding that and i think that's maybe a bridge too far